So, that's the main single player in a nutshell, but beyond that, what else is in this game? You might have noticed that I haven't even mentioned the mission events, so let's talk about those. It's no exaggeration to say that for me, the mission events are by far the best part of this game. You get a variety of events, ranging from callbacks to Gran Turismo 4, like the Overtake and Slipstream challenges, as well as the fabled One Lap Magic, where you race against much slower opponents who are given a head start, and you have a short amount of time to catch them. Why does that sound so familiar? We also get new challenges like drift events and drag races, which are a lot of fun, as well as these mileage trials, where you're tasked with going as far as you can with the limited fuel you have. Not the most exciting gameplay, but I appreciate them trying new things to add more variety to these challenges. My favourites though have to be the races. These really showcase GT7 at its best. A lot of them have changeable weather, so strategy plays a big part, and many of the AI are programmed to use different tyre compounds and strategies, so it can be really unpredictable at times. Going back to update 1.11, one of the additions was a set of 8 one hour long mission races, and again these are mostly great, with a lot of them featuring changeable weather and opponents using different strategies to keep you on your toes. But this being GT7, it can't all be perfect. Starting with a minor gripe, the one lap magic events force you to sit through the whole countdown, just like GT4. Guys, I know many people consider GT4 to be the best game, but you didn't have to do that as well. I don't see why they couldn't give us the option to skip the countdown and just simulate where the cars would be by that time. Surely a PS4 or a PS5 can handle that. Now, there are a few key differences between normal races in the world circuits and mission races. The first is simply that mission events don't play music. Apart from this one, for some reason. Now that's some real driving music. So if you normally play with the music on, tough luck. The second is far more important. Mission events only give you a payout the first time that you complete them. That is a big deal, because it means that if you win a mission race, you won't get paid for any subsequent attempts. So, after completing these races once each, all of the good work they put into making them fun and unique goes completely out of the window. You can't justify spending a whole hour doing a race that gives you literally nothing when GT7 is a game where money is so important. There is no replay value to these races whatsoever, and that just sucks. Even when they succeed at something, they still manage to fail in some way. It's just unbelievable. And it's not as if making these as regular World Circuit races would make them OP for money grinding, because in the same update they introduced three races which give even better money versus time payouts, which we will get to. Also, the mission races that existed before update 1.11 have a ridiculously low payout for some reason, even compared with other much shorter mission events. It seems as though they may have realised this issue because in a later update they added another one hour long race, but to the world circuits instead, meaning it can be replayed for more money. But these human comedy races are still trapped in the purgatory that is the missions, and that's just sad. I've talked a few times now about update 1.11 and some of the changes implemented, but I've yet to even explain why this came about in the first place. I'm sure many of you will already know, but this occurred due to complaints from the community that GT7 was too much of a grind, as you couldn't earn much money, and combined with the insane cost of some cars, meant that collecting the cars you wanted became extremely difficult. It was update 1.07, where some of the best paying races were slashed down, that really generated the backlash towards a game which even before the update didn't pay out a great amount. Combine this with the game's servers being down for almost a full day due to an issue with the update, and it was a PR nightmare for Gran Turismo. Needless to say, they needed to act fast, and only a couple of weeks later we got update 1.11. This provides context as to why they added the mission races and boosted the payouts for circuit experience. The point is that even though it was fairly easy to earn money early in the game, later in the game and certainly in the post game, the discrepancy between how many events there were to do and how much they paid out versus the cost of many of the higher end cars meant that grinding certain races over and over again was inevitable. At this point, I'd like to just explain why forcing players into a situation where grinding is the only realistic way to obtain something is awful game design. There is a sentiment that I've seen from some people that grinding is just a natural part of playing a game, and people who complain about it are just entitled, and don't want to work hard or put in any effort for their reward. Now, I can't speak for everyone on this, but for me, that's nowhere near the truth. Let's make a hypothetical. So, in situation A, you grind a single race over and over again for let's say two hours, 
because it's the best way to make money to buy a car you really want. So you grind for the two hours, you get the money and buy the car. Then in situation B, you have to win a really challenging set of events or even a championship, which takes twice as long, so four hours, and from that you win the same car. To me, situation B is far better and more rewarding, even though it takes double the time. The issue is not the effort you have to put in, but rather the way it's presented in the game. Giving players a unique challenge to earn something is much preferable than pretty much forcing them to replay an element over and over again if they want to buy it, even if that would be less time consuming and easier. This is where older GT games were so rewarding, because the idea of giving a reward based on a unique challenge was how they gave out prize cars. When you finished a 100% playthrough on those older games, you would have either won all of the cars, or have enough money by then to buy anything you wanted. Of course, not everyone will agree with that, and ultimately it's up to you to play the game in a way which you find the most enjoyable. If that's grinding the same race 20 times a day, then go for it. Even in a previous video, I talked about how I did the Clubman Cup Plus races a ridiculous amount of times, just because I find them fun. Not everything has to be about getting some sort of reward, but don't expect everyone to be on the same page. Giving people the choice between these two options would be the ideal outcome. And that's how it should be. But with GT7, there's nowhere near enough things to do for that to be a reality, and series producer Kazunori Yamauchi agrees with this, or at least he says he does. In a statement he put out after the 1.07 disaster, he said, I want to make GT7 a game in which you can enjoy a variety of cars lots of different ways, and if possible, would like to try to avoid a situation where a player must mechanically keep replaying certain events over and over again. So the question is, why did they design the game in a way where this would be inevitable? They have the metrics, they know how much total money there is from completing every event, including prize cars, and they know how much every single car costs to buy. So why was anybody involved in the game even surprised that this happened? And that leads us to our next point. The issues with the missions and circuit experience are that they are only one-time payouts, so once they're done, you can't get the money again. That would normally be fine, but even after completing all of these, you're still going to need a lot more cash to buy many of the other cars. So after saying that they don't want players to mechanically keep playing certain events over and over again, their next course of action was to add three races for you to specifically keep replaying over and over again. Nice of them to add three, I suppose, but how do I know this for certain? Well, a couple of reasons. Firstly, the fact that they are by far the best in terms of a money to time ratio when compared to any other replayable event. Secondly, is that regardless of how you drive, whether you're smashing into opponents or cutting corners, you will still get the clean race bonus every single time. They're not particularly subtle about it. And thirdly, is that since then, 10 months later, they are still the best races to grind. Despite the game adding more races which use faster cars and are arguably harder, these are still the best options for making money efficiently. So in my mind, that part of it is obvious. You know, we've talked so much about grinding money that I forgot what we're even grinding for in the first place. Oh yeah, that's right. So like I've said, the cost of certain cars is frankly insane, but even beyond just the top 1%, the values have generally inflated quite a lot. I mean, 48 grand for a sprinter with 55,000 miles on the clock? What? Of course, a lot of this is down to the inflation of prices for certain cars in the real world, and Kazunori in that same statement made this link very clear. The pricing of cars is an important element that conveys their value and rarity, so I do think it's important for it to be linked with the real world prices. So my question to him is, why? Why is that important? That may sound like a stupid question, since from even the original Gran Turismo, the in-game prices have always somewhat reflected the real-world value of these cars, with those changing over time as well. The point is that GT7 pushes this to a ludicrous degree. I think now is a good time to take a look at how the value of real-world cars are determined, and try and relate this back to GT7. I've identified four main areas that impact a real car's worth. Firstly, condition. This one is easy in how it relates to GT7, because used cars with higher mileage generally will have a less durable engine and body, and as such are worth less to purchase when compared to an equivalent new car bought from Brand Central. So that's a tick for GT7. Secondly is performance. That's another easy one, as generally higher performance cars will be worth more in GT7. It's a racing game, so driving and winning with faster and faster cars is a clear goal. That makes sense. Thirdly, I have rarity. This is where things start to get messy, mostly because the rarity of a real car is a big deal. If a car is designed and built by a certain group of people at a certain period in time, that can never be fully replicated. In GT7, you can have an infinite amount of these cars existing, far more than the number that exists in real life, because it's a video game. That's kind of the point. 
This idea cannot be paralleled in a video game without artificially limiting the total supply of cars available to all players. Not that they should do that either, dear god no, but that's the concept. And the final point is desirability slash historical significance. Again, very contentious, since the reasons and motives for wanting a car in real life can be drastically different from a video game. If you get a 1930s Alfa Romeo in real life, that's a big f***ing deal. Even people who don't know anything about cars would be able to tell. Getting one in GT7 is not, because what the hell are you supposed to do with it? And the only reason why anyone would care is because of the value, not any significance attributed to the car itself. Arguably, it reduces the importance of the car itself because at that point it just becomes a number, something to flaunt and say, look what I have. The car itself becomes irrelevant, which, ironically, is the opposite of what they were trying to achieve. Now, not to say that any historical or even emotional value is completely irrelevant in a racing game. These cars are supposed to be facsimiles of the real thing, so any attachment or fondness towards a particular model should be reflected, like in real life. I'm not saying that you should find this Alpha in the used dealership selling for 30 grand or something purely because it's slow by modern standards and also has no utility in the game. It's more that the value shouldn't be so directly linked to the real world value when the connotations of how the car exists in the game are so drastically different than that of real life. The cost of cars is capped at 20 million credits, but you get the feeling that without this, some of them would be priced even higher than that. You know, I read a comment, which was somewhat written in jest, saying that GT7 is trying to mirror the real-life experience of classic-slash-prestigious car ownership. But honestly, the more I think about it, the more that idea seems to add up when you consider how GT7 is designed. Think about it, the cars are just sat in a dealership for a million billion credits waiting to be bought, and when someone finally does, they just put them in a garage where they can look at them, I guess. GT7 has very few events for these historic cars, so the main draw is clearly not to race them, even if in real life people can and often do. This is the only reason which justifies the decision they've made here, and if so, that's really sad. It would represent a fatal misunderstanding of how people interact with racing games and why they even enjoy them. Hint, a big part is the racing, not for some faux historic car ownership experience nonsense. Well, anyway, Gran Turismo has shown that they now value realism in the most mundane ways above engaging and fun game design. Realism and how a player is forced to interact with and rewarded in the game is clearly so important to them. So anyway, about roulette tickets. But you probably already knew that. So instead of giving out meaningful prizes, like cars which are relevant to the event or championship which you won, GT7 gives you a Forza Horizon wheel spin. Great. But that's not fair on Forza Horizon because actually they're much worse. These roulette tickets are given out near constantly. Complete a menu book? Here's a roulette ticket. What about these extra menus? Roulette tickets. Your daily reward for logging in and driving a certain distance? Roulette tickets. You don't need to go far to see that most people despise the roulettes, and that's mostly for one reason. They appear to be rigged to give you the worst prize almost every single time. The truth is that they're predetermined from pretty much the moment you get the ticket. This has been proven by people using their tickets and then restarting their game without saving. When they open the tickets again, their prizes are exactly the same. Now, I'm not against the idea of roulette prizes entirely. Of course, GT3 had roulettes as well when you won a championship. The difference is that in GT3, the roulette was between four prize cars which were specifically chosen as prizes for that event. It also was truly random, and if you wanted a different prize, you could redo the championship, thus adding replay value. Or just save scum. The only drawback was that a lot of the time, the prizes weren't exactly equivalent in terms of value or desirability, and that's how things like this happen. And this car... What is it? Ew! It's pink! It's a Toyota Vitz. It's pink! Why is it pink? What car do I get? I can win one of four cars. Oh, yeah. Not even gonna say it. Not even gonna say it. Fan fing tastic. That's an amazing prize. Another pink Vitz. Now let's see what car I get. Well, at least it's not pink.
So GT7 takes that part of it and turns it up to 11. As I said, the prizes are predetermined, meaning that the other prizes you see are just set dressing. Sometimes you will even see prizes which are literally not possible to attain for that grade of ticket. I should mention that tickets come in tiers, with one star tickets being the worst with the lowest value prizes, all the way up to six stars which give the best rewards. In terms of money, I don't really care that much, although it isn't much of a draw to keep playing and get your ticket every day, when you know the reward is almost guaranteed to be hardly anything. In fact, I've calculated that in some cases with the lower payouts, you actually receive less money per minute spending the time to just open the ticket and watch the animation than you get per minute from grinding the best paying races. Crazy. But for me, the real issue is the other prizes you can get. GT7 has the best customization of any GT game, and one of its key additions are engine swaps finally making their debut in the series. At present, there are tons of different interesting and unique engine swaps, and they're adding more of them every month. They really are an awesome part of the game which everyone can enjoy. You can probably see where I'm going with this. The only way to obtain them is pure luck. And needless to say, you're going to need a lot of luck. Back in June last year, there was an exploit which allowed you to redeem pretty much infinite engine swaps. This is how I and many other people managed to get so many of them as we stockpiled whilst we could. But if we take those out of the equation, playing the game how it was intended, I've won maybe 7 or 8 engine swaps total, in a game which at present has 55 possible engine swap combinations. I've played this game for over 450 hours, and that's all I would have. And this is with intervention from Polyphony. You see, they recognised how unbelievably lucky you needed to be to get an engine swap from a regular roulette ticket, and came up with a solution. Was it to change the method of getting them from entirely luck to something more skill-based? No, they just give out some tickets specifically for engine swaps now. And so, the trend of them identifying an issue, but rather than solving the root cause of it, they just plaster over it, and act as if it's no longer there, continues. Whilst this has helped a little, because without these I would only have two legitimate engine swaps that I can remember getting from regular tickets, not everybody is so lucky. So, the way of getting these engine swap only tickets is from completing extra menus. Oh boy, they're back again. Ironically, it was through these extra menus that the exploit for infinite tickets was found. The big problem is that a lot of these extra menus require you to get cars which can only be found from the used car or legends car dealership, meaning if you don't have it already, you have to wait days or sometimes even weeks to find the car you need. And in the worst cases, these are cars costing multiple millions of credits, which you might not even want but need for the extra menu. And on top of that, the engine is decided at random, so you may end up with one you don't even want or need. So because of this, it really doesn't pass as anything close to a solution. Not to mention that we've now seen the possibility of needing cars for extra menus, which you can only get with a brand invitation. What's a brand invitation, some of you may ask? That's a great question. I wish Polyphony would ask themselves the same thing. Essentially, certain high-end cars in Brand Central require these brand invitations for you to actually purchase them. Can you guess how you earn a brand invitation? Yeah, this makes the extra menu solution even more ridiculous. These invitations were also on a timer, meaning that you only had 14 days to get the money to buy the cars from the point you got the invitation. Again, pressuring you to buy cars you may not even want, because you have no idea when you'll get another opportunity to do so. Once again, there was a lot of criticism towards GT7 for this as well, and once again, in update 1.11, they implemented their solution. They extended the invitations from 14 days to 30 days. That was it. Are you surprised? With roulettes, you can also win cars, very rarely, and tuning parts for cars that you may not even have and would never want to own. These even include special parts like ultra-high RPM turbos and stage 5 weight reduction, and there are also special roulette tickets specifically for parts, which again, you can get from the extra menus. It goes without saying that this is the antithesis of good game design, and I hope I've conveyed that to you as well. Way to make your players feel like dirt who deserve nothing. You could be goddamn Igor Fraga and you'd still be subject to this shit. Not to mention how it completely contradicts the realism they're trying to create in other areas, like the car collecting. Okay, so I've got to save up 20 million to buy this historic car from the legendary car dealership, which I can't really use for anything. But if I want this Bugatti, I've got to get an invitation to buy it, which I can get by collecting other random cars, or just driving 26 miles in a day, and then playing a slot machine where I have a minute chance of getting it. Nothing is consistent to anything. It's like they're trying to jam together puzzle pieces which don't fit. They use the excuse of realism when they can make the game more tedious, but suddenly when some form of reality check would really help, that all goes out of the window. It's inconceivable. So, we've talked at length about the problems. What about some solutions? Uh, trash the roulette tickets and let you buy the engine swaps. Job done. 
Okay, it's not that simple. I imagine a big part of them doing all of this is to try and stretch the content over a longer period of time so that people will keep coming back for more. I don't imagine it's been very successful, but that seems like the idea. So any solution we come up with has to be with this in mind. Anyway, still trash the roulette tickets, and with the engine swaps, what we can do is to tie the unlocking of them to certain milestones for that particular car. So, say you want that 4 rotor in your RX-7. The challenge could be something like win 10 races with the RX-7, or win a specific championship, or even earn a certain amount of drift points in it, something like that. That way, you've got a reason to keep playing, so players will stay invested, and for a lot of people, if they really enjoy the car, they'll just unlock it naturally anyway. For the manufacturer invites, we could give these as rewards for certain relevant things, like collecting a certain amount of cars from a given brand, or winning a certain race for that brand. Like for winning the Ferrari challenge, you could get the invitation to buy the FXXK. Also, once you get the invitation, you could keep it forever. So no more feeling pressure to buy the car as soon as possible, or getting invitations for cars you already have. For the unique parts, it's not a big deal, but we could again tie this to some form of accomplishment with the car, much like the engine swaps. As we've now gotten rid of roulette tickets, we don't have any incentive for people to play daily. We could bring back the seasonal event races, although that's probably asking too much to have those daily, so they can be weekly or bi-weekly as they were before. In terms of daily incentive, we can make one chosen race from the world circuits have increased payouts. They don't have to be insanely high, but around the same level as the current best paying races, and this could be shown as the daily special, updating every 24 hours. As solutions, I think those will work pretty damn well. I mean, give me a call polyphony and I'll just design the whole game for you while I'm at it. Let me know what you guys think and also leave your own suggestions in the comments. But as far as it goes for GT7, a lot of what I've mentioned is how it fails to live up to previous titles and do things nearly as well as them. But the reality is that it should be doing things better and bringing new and interesting experiences. Beyond getting shafted by the roulettes, I mean. While it's managed to devolve in so many ways, it hasn't really brought anything fresh to the table to offset that either, and there's no shortage of ideas. Here's an easy one larger grids and multi-class racing. This isn't even entirely new because they did dabble with it in GT Sport, where there were a couple of multi-class races and one that even featured a 30-car grid. Now it's possible that having GT7 on PS4 as well meant a trade-off had to be made here, but that is giving them the benefit of the doubt that it was even on their radar. Maybe they were just laser focused on getting ray tracing and replays instead or some other shit like that which nobody cares about. Even upping it to a 24-car grid I would have expected since they managed to do that on GT Sport briefly for even online races. Back in the day, at the end of every FIA season, they would have these top 24 superstars races for the best drivers in the region. I was actually fortunate enough to have competed in one of these as well. And when it comes to multi-class racing, the best we have on GT7 is a couple of missions, which I guess are multi-class. But maybe that's for the best, since the AI clearly weren't programmed with that in mind. It seems like the slower a car is going, the more trouble they have trying to overtake. It's bizarre. I know I should have mentioned this in the AI video, but here we are. Anyway, I was recently watching some gameplay from GT5 Prologue and saw something quite interesting. Well, aside from the fact that basically all of the menu music from there is reused in GT7, what I saw was an event type that's never returned to the series since then. The event was sort of like a time trial, but the difference was that you had 10 minutes to beat the lap time and there were other cars on the circuit as well. It sort of reminded me of a time attack session. This alone is interesting, but really they could take this even further such as instead of aiming for a set lap time, you have to beat the opponent's lap times. They could even have whole events and championships based on this. Obviously, it won't appeal to everyone, and would probably just end up as a mission, but still, it's those sort of interesting ideas I was hoping to see more of in GT7. But all we got to spice up the experience was nonsense like this. If it's not clear enough, I'll state it now. Gran Turismo 7 had the potential to be the greatest racing game of all time, and even despite the never-ending series of blunders it seems to go through, it's still decent. The base they're working with is simply incredible in terms of its technical output, but in almost every design decision, it seems to take the wrong turn and sabotages itself in truly unbelievable ways. So, what was the goal? I find myself asking this so often with respect to GT7. With actually good games, the goal is obvious, to make the game as fun and rewarding for the player as possible, and all design decisions are centred around that. Clearly, this is not the case for GT7. So, an obvious one we've mentioned is to keep players coming back. GT7 has been described as a live service, meaning that it will be consistently updated over time, and new things will keep being added to draw players back in. It also explains a lot of these bizarre design choices in terms of actual content and rewards, since they're trying to stretch the player experience over a longer period of time. But you don't need to look far to see the flaw with this logic, because if they don't add new content regularly, 
or the new content they do add isn't very interesting, then the game is basically dead in the water. As we've seen when there was no January updates, and even when there has been updates, it hasn't done much to improve the state of the game. Most months you can get through the new content in about an hour, and that's all there is. Now, this wouldn't be a big deal if GT7 was a complete game from the get-go, but as we've seen, it is far from that, so it kind of lives and dies by its post-launch support. And that support hasn't been particularly strong. Each month, we get a handful of cars and very occasionally a new track, which I don't have too many issues with. People can and often do complain endlessly about which cars and tracks they want in the game, but to me, the issue is not what they do add, but rather what they don't add to the game. Through none of the recent updates have they solved any real issues with the game, or even given the impression that they might, and nothing they add feels fresh or gives players a new experience. Going back to update 1.11, where they added a new set of mission races, we were promised that there was plenty more to come. Ten months later and we're still waiting for anything new or meaningfully different, whilst they just keep recycling the same bland style of races over and over and over again. Clearly, Gran Turismo 7 is not alone in this. Looking at video games as a whole, this is the approach that many franchises have switched over to, and very few of them pull it off well. And it's not as if this is the only option. You only need to look back at games like GT3 and GT4 in particular, that are still widely played and talked about even decades later. The staying power of these well-designed and fully fleshed out games is immense. Now, imagine if they could design a game like this, and then support it with additional content adding new and interesting experiences. The results would be incredible. But simply put, it seems like they don't want to put the effort in to do that, so instead they defer to the cheap tactics that we've seen to keep people hooked. And this doesn't even seem to be working. I've received countless comments from people stating that they've given up on GT7 and sometimes even the Gran Turismo series as a whole, and to be honest, I can't blame them. When it feels like they've implemented mechanics to make the experience worse, and then refuse to change or even accept any form of feedback on this, many players will understandably not stick around. It's not a coincidence that pretty much all YouTubers covering GT7 focus on the online stuff, because at the moment, that part of the game is the only thing that holds any value to most players. Since I'm pretty burnt out on online racing from GT Sport, I don't really have much to do. Even if there are more cars to collect, I respect my time too much to waste it just grinding, which I've already done a fair amount of. To be honest, the only thing that keeps me coming back at this point are the time trials, where I can earn an easy couple of million, and they keep me from getting too rusty. Now, I imagine through the course of these past couple of videos, there'll be people practically screaming at their screens by this point with one thing in mind. What about the microtransactions? The narrative for a lot of people, and certainly this was the case with the complaints just after launch, was that GT7 was designed like this specifically to force people towards buying in-game credits, and was entirely fueled by greed. So, this isn't going to make me very popular, but to be frank, I don't agree with this. For the most part, at least. To be clear, I don't blame anyone for feeling this way, and certainly the evidence for this argument is very strong. Having the prices for a lot of cars jacked up to insane amounts, having races which don't pay out very much, and then even reducing those payouts as well, it's obvious to see why people thought this way. And combine this with seeing this happen to many other games before, there was very little trust to go on. So, while I think this is mostly a misunderstanding, I do not feel sorry for them whatsoever, since they brought this entirely on themselves. Hiding the cost of these microtransactions from reviewers, and only revealing them after the fact, was a very scummy thing to do, as was reducing the payouts. Although it didn't really make sense for this random dirt race to be the best moneymaker, hence why they nerfed it, the fact that they didn't replace it or increase payouts for many other events was incredibly short-sighted, and that's entirely on them. But as for the accusations, Firstly, an incredibly stupid one was that GT7 was pay to win. Pay to win what? This classic car which I can't even do anything with? It is by definition not a pay to win game. As for the more grounded complaints, let's have a look at the pricing of cars. So regarding this statement from Kazunori about reflecting the real world prices of cars, whilst I completely disagree with it, as I've stated, I 100% accept that this is truly what he believes. Whilst others may view it as a cop out or an excuse, to me, it seems to line up with his vision for the series. We will talk about his vision another time, I am sure, because that's a whole other can of worms. I think part of the problem was that it escalated beyond just the realm of racing games and into the wider gaming sphere. To people who've never played a Gran Turismo game and never even heard of Kazunori or Polyphony Digital. This meant that a lot of assumptions were made, and a lot of those were that the creators had bad intentions with all of this. 
Let me just say that I started playing this series with GT3 back in the early 2000s and have kept up to date with it almost religiously since about 2009 on the run up to the release of GT5. This includes reading and watching basically every article and interview about the games that I could possibly get my hands on. And what that means is that over the past decade and a half that I've been following the series, what most people would agree to be the most turbulent era of the series, I feel like I've got a pretty decent handle on how Kazunori thinks and makes decisions. Or at least I think I do. One thing I know for certain is that when he makes a design choice, he does so with the utmost conviction. In his mind, he has come to a conclusion and formed a vision of where the series should go and what the game should be like, and will not be convinced otherwise. This is the reason why Gran Turismo came to be in the first place, and also became so great, but also how some of the most baffling ideas for the series came about. A recent example is with the car valuation service. People had been desperate to sell cars in GT7, for various reasons, and it took months for them to finally implement a seemingly very simple feature. But instead of a simple sell car for percentage of what you paid system, they developed this dynamic in-game ecosystem where prices fluctuate based on market trends. An interesting idea, but not one many people were asking for. In practice, it functions fairly similar to the old way, as you're always paid a bit less than what the car is actually worth. It also makes you wonder how they determine price changes for cars which don't actually exist and never have. Kazunori's idiosyncratic way of thinking often leads to ideas and mechanics that nobody else would realistically think to put in a racing game, and combined with a real lack of transparency, tends to lead towards missed expectations and general confusion. All of this is to say, I can envision a version of GT7 where microtransactions were never even mentioned in the design process, but the game still ended up the exact same way. The assumption has been that they're only in the game at the request of the higher-ups at Sony, but this can't be proven for certain. I will say that through my research, Kazunori and Polyphony have never struck me as being so money-oriented, just more interested in reaching as many players as they can. Essentially, I'm arguing for incompetence rather than greed and deception on the part of Polyphony. I mean, you have to admit, if you still genuinely believe that all of this was fueled entirely by greed, they have done a monumentally bad job of designing the game around this either. Think about it, the cars which are so overpriced, the main crux of all of this, have no purpose in the game. There's no reason to need them, and unless you have an attachment or interest in a particular model already, the game gives you no reason to even want them. You could remove all of the cars from the Legends dealer from the game entirely, and nothing would change. It's almost as if they designed the whole thing so you wouldn't want to buy or own any of them. It's just incredible. And also with other decisions. How does making the game extremely linear and boring make people want to buy credits? The lack of original events, how does that play into it? Even the roulette tickets with its maddening false realities don't seem to fit. I mean, if you could buy roulette tickets, thank fuck they didn't do that by the way, but if they did, then you could at least say, oh okay, then they're just money hungry bastards then. But they didn't, and that's what makes their inclusion even more dumbfounding. What was the point of any of this? If I had to make a top 10 list of the weirdest design decisions in racing games that I've ever played, GT7 would have like 8 or 9 of those. If you're ever playing GT7 and wonder to yourself, why doesn't this feel as fun as the older games, or at least as fun as it should be, just remember this video. Because even if the mainstream and game reviewers don't value game design in racing games, GT7 proves that it matters a whole lot more than they can ever imagine. Whew, that's another long one. Thanks again if you managed to get all the way through. This video, out of all the videos I've made on GT7 so far, is the most important to me. It covers topics and issues which are so glaringly obvious to anyone who can form any sort of critical opinion that it just leaves you speechless at times with some of the decisions they made here. Making this video, I had to keep going back and double checking things because I thought, no, that can't be as bad as I remember, but pretty much every time it was. With all of that said, you might be surprised to hear that I'm not done with these videos. I still have more things to say about GT7, it's just that type of game it seems, but I will be taking a slight break from these specific videos because my next project is more of a retrospective, but maybe not in the way you might expect. Hopefully that should be good to go for next Tuesday the 28th, so stick around for that. If you enjoyed this or agree with my points here, then please like and subscribe for more, and also share it with anyone who might be interested. It takes a lot of time and effort to produce these videos, edit it all together and make it look nice and slick, so any support you can give would be much appreciated. I've had some spare time recently to really focus on these videos, but that probably won't be the case forever. Even still, I just love making them, so if I can continue to do that long term, then I can't really ask for more. But yeah, I'll catch you guys next time and have a good one.